Um, we recently, as you heard uh, earlier on, got involved with the uh, O'Reilly Solid Group, and uh, we're going to welcome John Bruner up from that group. He's the co-chair of the O'Reilly Solid Conference, and they're focused on the intersection between software and the physical world, and he oversees O'Reilly's publications on hardware, the Internet of Things, uh, editor of Forbes magazine, uh, where he, he uh, combined writing and programming to, uh, uh, to approach a broad variety of subjects, from the operation of the Columbia River's dams to migration within the United States. He's, uh, he's been a busy boy, it sounds like. Um, he lives in San Francisco and can occasionally be found at the console of a pipe organ. Well, we'd like to bring up uh, uh, John Bruner. Please come up. Thanks. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here, and especially because um, Ant Plus was such a big part of one of the, the foundational demonstrations that we had at the O'Reilly Solid Conference back in June. I'll tell you a little bit about that um, in a minute, but a lot of the stuff that you're doing here is very much part of a big, important movement. Uh, and we call this the new hardware movement, for lack of a better term, to be honest. Uh, this is all about access and the way that creating physical products, being innovative in physical products and hardware, is starting to become easier and starting to take on some of the characteristics of innovation in software. So a lot of this is by um, analogy to some of the progression that we've seen in computing over the last uh, 60 or so years. If you look back at the beginning of programming, we're talking strictly about virtual stuff here, the, uh, the bits as opposed to the atoms. Uh, when, when general purpose programming emerged around World War II, uh, it looked like this. It was highly specialized. You had to be a mathematician in order to program a computer. Uh, there weren't abstracted programming languages, high-level programming languages at all. You had to understand the, the fundamental architecture of a computer in order to make use of it. Uh, so this is ENIAC. Um, programming a computer like this at the very beginning involved you know, connecting jumpers between different modules to form the logic physically. Soon we got uh, high-level programming languages, and by the 70s, computing looked like this. It had changed radically uh, in terms of you know, the arrival of high-level programming languages, basic abstraction. You could write you know, 2 plus 2 and get 4. Uh, but it's still pretty specialized. Um, a computer that you use to manage payroll would be quite different from a computer that you use to manage industrial automation. And the people who run computers are still specialized. There's still people who have formal training in computer programming. Uh, though they don't necessarily have to understand the fundamental architecture of computers anymore the way that the people who programmed computers by connecting jumpers did in the 40s. And of course, uh, since then, today, computing has become completely ubiquitous and, uh, and software is something that you can use as just a, a common tool uh, in your life. It's like driving a car. It takes about as long to learn how to do basic programming as it does to learn how to drive a car. Um, junior high school students, 10-year-olds uh, learn how to program computers now, commonly in schools. You can learn JavaScript in a weekend uh, and start to solve basic problems. So it's something that you can throw at anything. This, for instance, is some terrible code that I wrote last spring. Over the course of a day or so, we had received 500 proposals for the SOLID conference, and I wanted to take the committee feedback that we'd gotten on it and sort it and aggregate it and pull out keywords and so on. I could write bad programming, uh, bad code, and it would still work because um, the, the platforms that software runs on have improved so much that you can write bad code and still get results out of it. Everything has become powerful, everything has become abstracted, and now you can use computing informally. You don't have to be an expert to get value from it. So we're starting to see some of these same changes in, in hardware. Hardware development has always been much, much trickier than software development, at least the kind of software development that you see here. Um, and, and we owe this to a handful of simultaneous changes in the way that we create physical things that's making it more like the process for creating software. So in design and digital prototyping, for instance, we have all of these beautiful cubes. Um, this is a, uh, an other mill. It's a CNC mill in the, in the middle. And on the far right is a, a Form 1 3D printer. They both cost about the same in the $2,000 to $3,000 range. Um, so we're not talking about hobbyist machines here, but this is putting you know, desktop fabrication 
uh, within reach of, of professionals from a wide variety of backgrounds. And critically, these are really easy to use. They link very, um, very intuitively to digital design software like Fusion 360, which is a new, um, a new platform from Autodesk that came out a couple of years ago and costs much less than AutoCAD and lets you basically just hit an export button to go to a 3D printer or desktop mill the same way that you're used to hitting a print button to go from desktop publishing to physical paper. So this kind of design has gotten much easier, and as it's gotten easier, the feedback loops have gotten a lot tighter, right? You're not, um, you're not designing something in software and then sending it off to an injection molding facility and getting it back three weeks later. You are getting your test enclosure in a couple of hours. And this is radically changing the pace at which physical things can be created and developed, and it's making it possible to be much more adventurous too, right? You can, you can go down a lot of avenues. You can prototype hundreds of, of enclosures, hundreds of physical designs in just a couple of days uh, and, and go through a lot of iterations. In components, uh, as you all know, this has been a very dramatic set of changes. Um, in, terms of both um, in terms of both cost and ease of use. So uh, this is what Mark Andreessen has called the dividend from the smartphone wars, the peace dividend from the smartphone wars, excuse me. Um, the idea is that anything that's in a mobile phone has gotten dramatically cheaper thanks to the volume and cost competition in the mobile phone space, especially the smartphone space. So things like the MEMS devices that you see on the left here have fallen by an order of magnitude and cost over the last uh, five to 10 years, in many cases much more than an order of magnitude in cost. Um, LCD displays, uh, like the one that you see uh, in the middle of this slide, have gotten 35% cheaper in the last six months alone, which is insane. You can add a screen to, uh, to anything now at minimal cost, so why not? A lot of people do it. Um, connectivity has gone from being um, a guaranteed headache for any uh, hardware creator to being something that you can incorporate in an early prototype and then move through with and, and, uh, and implement quite easily. Uh, you see, of course, the, the ant modules, but also um, prototyping platforms that, that take the difficulty out of networking. Um, these are uh, uh, prototyping boards from Particle, uh, which used to be called Spark, and which is a, like a plug and play Wi-Fi and cellular connectivity platform that makes it extraordinarily easy to connect anything you're building to the internet. So you take these kinds of modules, and if you're a, a, a reasonably knowledgeable practitioner of electronics, uh, you can put them together very rapidly. You can even approach them now if you're not an electrical engineer necessarily. If you have a generalized technical background, you can take the types of modules that you see here and tie them together, at least through the prototyping stage before you get into the heavy engineering. Uh, as processors have improved, have gotten lower power and more um, have, have, have gone down in power consumption and have become faster. Uh, we've seen higher level programming languages migrate to, uh, to places where they hadn't been before. Uh, we had a lot of interest back in June at our conference in sessions about using Node.js for embedded systems, which is uh, an insane thought if you think of um, what that would have meant five years ago to run JavaScript on, on an embedded chip. Now it's commonplace and it's driven by uh, the rise of uh, you know, inexpensive but powerful embedded boards, like this is a, ra a Raspberry Pi, as well as demand from uh, people who, who are software engineers who want to start to work in hardware, and they want to use the platforms that they're familiar with. And they're willing to trade off a little bit on performance in order to shorten the development time uh, very dramatically. As this stuff has improved, we've seen changes in, in the architecture of, uh, of computing and connecting. Uh, and this is, of course, where, where Ant is really interesting as, a, as, a mesh, um, as offering a, you know, a mesh architecture. Um, this graphic is from Cisco, and it depicts something that they have termed fog computing. So the idea is that you, know, you have the ground and the cloud. And in the cloud model, everything on the ground is talking to the cloud. And you kind of go back and forth. Um, the idea here in fog computing is that computing happens on the ground and in the cloud and everywhere in between. So there's a lot of intelligence and a lot of connectivity going on throughout the, throughout the, module, the, the model. Uh, and this means that you can do intelligent things um, locally. 
You can talk to other devices locally. You don't have to deal with the latency of going up to the internet. You don't have to send a lot of data upstream. Um, you can make decisions all over the place and, and be very intelligent about it. You're starting to see this architecture emerge um, and, and, it's, and it's an interesting, um, an interesting movement in terms of making the stuff around us very rapid and very intelligent. The kinds of logistics and services that underlie the product development process have, have improved very dramatically in the last few years. I was talking with a couple of people uh, last night about DigiKey, which now offers you know, overnight delivery for any of the, uh, the I want to say, tens of millions of SKUs that they stock. It's more than Amazon that they stock. Um, this means that you know, developing a piece of electronics, trying out a bunch of components, is a matter of just putting in an order and waiting until the next morning. Uh, service bureaus like Proto Labs will do your injection molding in a matter of a few days if it's reasonably simple. Um, you don't have to wait weeks. You don't have to send faxes to service bureaus to specify your injection molds. And then uh, organizations like PCH that manage sophisticated supply chains uh, in China and elsewhere have made finding, uh, you know, assembling a, um, a supply chain a reasonably easy process even if you don't have experience in, in manufacturing. For startups, there's, there's been a rapid development in fundraising and expertise related to hardware. Until a few years ago, all of the big VCs in the Bay Area were focused on software. And indeed, the, uh, the economics of software are still incredible. So that's still where the majority of the VC money is going. Um, but we've seen this, uh, this realization that you can develop and market a consumer product on a budget of as little as $500,000 to get to the first shipment, and that this makes it an interesting field for, um, for the startup you know, community to focus on. So uh, Highway 1 is a division of PCH. Lab 9 is a division of Flextronics. Um, there are a couple of independent ones, like Bolt in Boston, Lemnos in San Francisco that does a lot of B2B hardware, uh, and Hackcelerator, which is specialized in helping North American companies get introduced to the Chinese manufacturing ecosystem in, in Shenzhen. And of course, uh, the environment in Shenzhen has rapidly changed the, the process of getting things made. This is another one of the part of the peace dividend from the smartphone war. Um, the, the environment in Shenzhen is incredible for rapidly developing hardware. Um, this is a photo that my colleague David Craner took while he and Marcelo Coelho we're in Shenzhen to, to have early runs of, uh, of the alike bands made for the pop-up factory, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, this is at Seed Studio. They took a design from David and Marcelo uh, specification and, um, and, and Eagle files, and within a couple of weeks uh, had, had rolled off a thousand finished PCBs from the assembly line. So these, these manufacturers have become incredibly flexible, incredibly competitive. They've become highly automated, uh, and so you're seeing domestic contract manufacturers develop this uh, kind of capability as well. A lot, of, a lot of early runs happen in North America and Europe and then move to Shenzhen, um, but the entire process is becoming very flexible and very approachable to people who have a, you know, a general technical background, but not necessarily a hardcore um, hardware background or manufacturing background. Um, Finally, marketing has become a very important aspect of this, particularly for the startups. It makes uh, organizations like Etsy, uh, Amazon Marketplace, and Kickstarter make niche markets accessible to, uh, to people who are developing hardware. So you don't have to develop a mass market piece of hardware that you sell at Target and Walmart in order to have a viable business. You can create runs of you know, a few thousand pieces and market them directly to a well-defined audience through sites like this. Um, you might have seen, by the way, that Etsy is developing a program to help its, manu its um, sellers manufacture stuff at, at higher and higher uh, volumes. They're becoming a player in the manufacturing and supply chain area as well. Uh, all of this is, is uh, went into the demo that a few of you have mentioned earlier this morning called the pop-up factory that we had at Solid back in June. Marcelo Coelho, who spoke here last year, um, has developed these bands. They're called alike bands. Uh, as described earlier, they have a, a module on your wrist that you wear with a neoprene strap. 
you walk up to a tablet, um, program in your interests, your check boxes corresponding to your interests, uh, tag your wearable to a, a transponder, and then put it on. And you walk around and you hold up your wearable to other people's wearables. And if you have interests in common, uh, a light turns green under the wristband. If you don't have interests in common, the light turns red under the wristband. And as it turns out, the light turning red under the wristband encourages conversation even better than the, than the light turning green, because people go, how could it possibly be that we have nothing in common? So, uh, and then they start listing things that they enjoy. So, uh, we, we um, with, with the support of, of organizations, including um, Ant, we pulled off this incredible, uh, or rather, David and Marcelo pulled off this incredible demonstration in the exhibit hall at Solid called the Pop-Up Factory, where we manufactured electronics uh, directly on the floor of the conference and handed them hot off the assembly line to attendees. So uh, what you see here is the electronics assembly line on the front. Behind the team here that worked on this, uh, there's a bank of, of 3D printers. These are Formlabs printers. They're uh, manufacturing, they're fabricating the, um, the enclosures for the wristbands. Attendees got to specify a design that they wanted on the enclosure, and it would come out uh, an hour or two later. You could, you could go for generative designs so that no one's wristband was identical to anyone else's. Uh, and then in front, uh, on, the, on the tables laid out, was a, a full process electronics PCB assembly line. Uh, you had a pick and place machine, a reflow oven, a test jig, and, um, and at the bottom you can see the result. This is a, a PCB that's been assembled in, in a, just a couple of minutes, stand directly in front of a crowd of people, uh, and ready to be snapped together and handed to, uh, handed to an attendee. So this, this illustrates the, the kind of flexibility that you can draw on now as a product creator. We uh, at O'Reilly only signed off on this demo and, and loosened up some of the money for it about two months before the conference. So this went from concept to uh, rolling off the assembly line in a high profile way in the middle of a conference in, in less than two months. Uh, that's an extraordinarily short period for product development and it reflects a, a few things. The, the physical design process, the physical prototyping and manufacturing processes that I mentioned earlier, but also the ease of programming this stuff. Um, Marcelo had some of the designs for the electronics ready to go from previous deployments, but uh, he wrote completely new software for it uh, and was able to do that in, in a couple of months while still working on the manufacturing. So this stuff has become incredibly abstracted and easy to approach in ways that it never has been before. Um, a couple of months ago, I was struck uh, by this, this segment from uh, a book called Turing's Cathedral by George Dyson, which is about the early computing effort in the 1940s and 50s. And Richard Feynman says, the trouble with computers is you play with them. So this is, he's being tongue in cheek, of course. We all know, uh, being technical people, how much fun it is to sit down with some, uh, some, some empty canvas and start to experiment with it. To sit down with a wireless module and get your first kind of hello world handshake out of it, to try out a new protocol um, for, for designing something and see the outcome of the design, to start printing something on a pre 3D printer or milling something conceptual on a, on a CNC mill. Um, and what's remarkable about this is that the hardware electronics are becoming accessible to this kind of play in the way that software has been for some time. So uh, here we have, we, we've seen this uh, take place through a handful of handful of sig signals. Uh, the first is that Maker Faire has been around for more than 10 years now. This is a giant gathering of, of hobbyists, electronics hobbyists and, and creators uh, that's taken place in the Bay Area in San Mateo and in New York City uh, and attracts around 100,000 or more people to each of those events, plus tens of, of other local Maker Faire events that happen in, in other cities around the world at really surprisingly large scale. So hardware and electronics uh, have become accessible, not just to, to deeply technical people, but to hobbyists who are doing this in their garages on the weekends for fun. Um, you, you go to Maker Faire and you hear people talking about 
uh, the SOCs that they're using, the wireless protocols that they're using. A lot of these people have general technical backgrounds. Maybe they're software engineers by day, and this is something they do with their kids. But the idea that, that, that fabricating electronics could become a hobbyist activity is really radical and is something that's been in, enabled by the same trends that we've seen uh, in affecting the, the professional software uh, hardware development process. If you go to Shenzhen um, and walk around the electronics markets, one of the striking things that you see in addition to the components and the, and the raw materials for electronics that are on sale, you see a lot of finished devices. Um, really strange, small run mobile phones in particular. Uh, they all run on, um, on, the, same, on the same platforms. Um, they're, they're, they're mostly media tech phones, but they, they take different form factors uh, that are all incredibly different and very creative. A friend of mine bought a, a mobile phone that looks like a sports car, and when you pull back the convertible top, a, uh, a cigarette lighter is revealed, which uses a, a resistive wire to, uh, to heat up enough that you can light a cigarette with it, and then you close it and you put it back in your pocket at probably great danger to yourself. Um, <laughs> what you see here is a, uh, is a phone that a, a, a friend of ours named Bunny Wong brought back from the markets. Um, this is a, a mobile phone that is in the shape of a skull, when you hold down the home button in the middle, the thing explodes uh, in a series of, of screams. Uh, the, the screen displays this awful image of a, of a, um, a, a, a fiery skeleton. Uh, the lights on the, on the, in the eyes and in the nose light up. And when you open the thing up, it's extraordinarily sophisticated. It has two SIM card slots. It has a beautiful laser engraving on the inside. Um, this, this phone is, though it costs uh, under $20, one of the most extravagant things you could imagine, right? So much work went into this, and it's a very sophisticated phone. Uh, it is, it's very creative, and it's all done in a very s small run um, context. So people are having fun with, with these things, even commercially. And for this reason, I, I call this phone the GeoCities phone. We're following in the, same, in the same footsteps as the development of the web in the 90s, where people put together uh, really awful websites on platforms like Angel, Fire, and, uh, and GeoCities, and Tripod, you know, with the blinking GIFs of, of construction banners, with the animated uh, star backgrounds. This stuff was purely experimental, and you look back on it and you go, this is incredibly silly and a waste of everyone's time. Uh, but what you're starting to see are, are little bits of evidence that creative people have gotten new tools in their hands and are starting to play with them and starting to try out new things with them. 